Well, good morning, everyone, and welcome. Uh, my name is Florence Turcott. I'm literary manuscripts archivist here at the University of Florida. As such, I serve as the curator of the Marjorie Canan Rawlings Papers, our flagship literary collection. Some of you may have noticed the exhibit cases um, along the wall over here, um, where we have some of the materials related to the yearling on display. As many of you know, this year we are celebrating the 75th anniversary of the yearling, from publication to Pulitzer. While planning this series of wonderful events, our task force brainstormed ideas for programming to attract diverse audiences, from old movie buffs to foodies to serious scholars of literature and history. More than a year ago, I envisioned this event to bring together all of these for a day-long, engaging, and informative festival celebrating Marjorie and her classic novel. That day has finally come, and I could not be more excited to welcome you, the audience, and our distinguished panel of scholars for this program. I'd like to thank the George A. Smathers Libraries for hosting this program and for allowing us to use this wonderful venue for our symposium. In partnership with the Marjorie Canan Rawlings Historic State Park, we are proud to call ourselves the keeper of Rawlings flame, although this is somewhat an unfortunate metaphor for an archivist to use. <laughs> I'd also like to thank the Marjorie Canan Rawlings Society and the friends of the Marjorie Canan Rawlings Farm for providing our panelists and attendees with refreshments for this event. The idea for this symposium, examining the historical context of the yearling, came about through a somewhat cryptic reference to the early, 19, the, the early 1870s in the text itself. The story of how Penny Baxter came to live in the big scrub with his family will be examined in further detail by Ann Pierce in today's first presentation. But in chapter two, Rawlings actually places her characters in the remoteness and isolation of no man's land in this quasi-biblical passage. And I'm quoting. <coughs> when the loneliness of the place had begun to frighten him a little, and his wife was almost past the age of bearing, Jody Baxter was born and thrived. When the baby was a toddling two-year-old, <coughs> Penny had gone to the war. He had taken his wife and child to the river to live with his crony, Grandma Huto, for the few months he expected to be away. He had come back at the end of the four years with the mark of age on him. He had gathered up his wife and boy and taken them back to the scrub with gratitude for its peace and isolation. The primary narrative picks up about six years after Penny's return when Jody is 12. So assuming he came back in 1865, our story begins in 1871 on a bright and beautiful April morning. So go back to that place and time in your imagination with me and take this journey through Florida history with our presenters. Before we set off on our journey, I'd like to introduce you to Judy Russell, the Dean of the University Libraries, who wishes to extend her welcome to you on behalf of the George A. Smathers Libraries. Thank you. Thank you, Flo. And uh, I want to reiterate that we're just thrilled that you're here today with us in this wonderful room where we uh, manage uh, this collection and make it available for scholars. And uh, it seems a very appropriate place for you to come together to discuss this. Uh, we're very pleased that people have come from around the state and from many different disciplines to join us today to explore uh, Florida history and explore the yearlings, uh, real environment, because it seemed very, very real, I think, to her as she wrote it. Uh, Flo was showing me the, the map, and I think you'll hear, be, be hearing more of that. But this obviously was not really fictional to her in many ways. These, these people were very real. The place was very real. It was a part of her. 
and she was sharing it with others. And so um, I'm delighted that you're here today and, and hope you will enjoy the day. And we're really pleased that uh, you let us um, use our facilities here for you to come together to talk about her and to talk about Florida history. So I hope you enjoy your day very much, and we look forward to having you come back many times and certainly uh, to come back at any time that you wish to use the collection and, and really um, engage with these treasures, because they are treasures, and we do value enormously the fact that we have them and we want them to be um, something that people do interact with and, and relate to and not um, things that are locked up in a vault, but things that are available for researchers and scholars. So it's great for us that you're here, and I hope you have a wonderful day. It sounds like a great program. Thank you so much. Thank you, Judy. Um, next, I'm introducing the moderator for our, um, our program this morning and this afternoon. Um, ben Brote Markle is the executive director of the Florida Historical Society. He is producer and host of Florida Frontiers, the weekly radio magazine of the Fl Florida Historical Society. You may have heard it on Gainesville People, may have heard it on WUFTFM, um, and it's uh, syndicated in a lot of different um, venues, uh, PBS. Um, I mean, NPR venues. Uh, Dr. Brote Markle is author of four books on Florida history and culture, including Beyond the, the Theme Parks, Exploring Central Florida. He was named the Barnes & Noble Chair of Academic Excellence and Distinguished Editor, ed Educator at Eastern Florida State College. Welcome, Ben Brote Markle. Thank you. Well, I'm, I'm very happy to be here this morning and, and happy to be part of this uh, World of the Yearling Symposium. Welcome. If I asked you to identify the three most important, enduring, and popular novels that uh, feature the natural Florida as almost a main character, what, what three books would you mention? What, what three books would you pick? Land Remembered. Land Remembered, okay. The Yearling, of course. Their eyes were watching God. You all are great. Uh, that's th those were my three picks as well, uh, and I, I think that just about anybody would pick those three books uh, in, in no particular order. But yes, Patrick Smith's *A Land Remembered*, Zora Neale Hurston's *Their Eyes Were Watching God*, and of course Marjorie Kinnan Rawlings' *The Yearling*. Uh, each of these books makes the reader feel connected to Florida and its its natural environment and its people in unique and profound ways. All three of these books, in addition to making us feel connected to nature and people, inspire us with, with stories of these people overcoming incredible odds and, and uh, overcoming unexpected freezes and, and hurricanes and, and floods and, and other obstacles as they strive to make a life in Florida. Living in Florida also provides the main characters in each of these novels opportunities for, for personal growth in different ways. And although all of these three novels are, are primarily set in the late 19th and or the, the early 20th centuries, they, they still speak to audiences today uh, while they still capture a particular place in time in Florida. They, they still speak to us today. The Yearling, of course, was written in uh, 1938 and won the Pulitzer Prize in, in 1939. It's been translated into 29 different languages around the world. The novel was made into a film in 1946, starring Gregory Peck and Jane Wyman. And despite the, the snow-capped mountains in the, in the, on the uh, movie poster and now the DVD cover, uh, the, the film introduced new audiences to the to Florida of Marjorie Kinnan Rawlings. Michael Leonard and, and Herbert Martin wrote a Broadway musical adaptation of The Yearling in 1965, but not many of us have seen it because it only uh, had three performances on Broadway. Uh, a couple of the songs uh, from that show still endure, though. You may have heard uh, I'm Still Smiles and Why Did I Choose You. Uh, they, they were recorded by Barbara Streisand and, and remain popular. But uh, it, it might be time for a revival of that, that musical. We'll, 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 Florida Historical Society might have to look into that. 
And I, I haven't, haven't seen it, but I understand there was even a Japanese animated version of The Yearling that was produced in 1983. And there was a 1994 uh, television adaptation featuring Philip uh, Seymour Hoffman. So, uh, you know, a, a lot of uh, interpretations. It, it shows how popular and enduring that this, this story is. Flo mentioned that, that I produce and host uh, Florida Frontiers, the, the weekly radio magazine of the Florida Historical Society, which is heard on WUFT uh, Saturday mornings at 6 and Sunday mornings at 7.30. And some of our most popular segments from that program have dealt with Marjorie Kinnan Rawlings and, in particular, The Yearling. Uh, over the past uh, five years, we've had segments on uh, comparing the work of Marjorie Kinnan Rawlings and Marjorie Stoneman Douglas and their works on uh, their, their views on environmentalism. Uh, we had a, a, a program that looked at the newly discovered uh, letter from Marjorie Kinnan Rawlings uh, to her nemesis, uh, Zalma Kaysen. We had a, a segment on uh, Ben DiBiase, who will be presenting later uh, this morning, and I had a conversation on the program about the Williamson Farm Daybook and other documents in the Florida Historical Society archive, and that sent uh, scholars <laughs> right to our, to our archive to investigate these, these important documents that you'll be hearing more about. Uh, soon on the program, we're going to feature Betty Jean Steinshower, who I uh, interviewed a while ago when she, she was at our Library of Florida History, but uh, she'll be talking about Marjorie Kinnan Rawlings uh, soon on the program, and I'm sure that will be popular as well. Uh, there's, there's all sorts of evidence of the, the enduring popularity of Marjorie Kinnan Rawlings. The Florida Historical Society uh, Facebook page has uh, almost 4,500 uh, fans that follow us and uh, you know certain topics just explode with with comments on, on social media anytime we have a photograph and a mention of Marjorie Kinnan Rawlings in, in any way whatsoever it, it explodes with comments about how many, how much people love the yearling and how important it is uh, to their lives and, and I mention all of this again to demonstrate the enduring legacy of Marjorie Kinnan Rawlings and and the yearling and we have a very distinguished panel here today uh, to talk about a lot of different aspects of, uh, of, uh, of this book and its enduring legacy and different aspects of it. Uh, we'll hear from our panel and I'll be introducing each one of them individually as we go through the day as they're about to present. And then when they're done this afternoon, we will have the opportunity for your questions. So please be considering questions and comments that you have for our speakers uh, because we'll get to them at the, at the end of the day. So again, I want to welcome you to the, to the World of the Yearling Symposium. Uh, and uh, uh, Ann Pierce has told me that she has more than half an hour of really outstanding information for you. So as they say in Congress, I'm going to yield the balance of my time, just a, a couple of minutes here, to, uh, to Ann Pierce. And I want to introduce uh, her as our, as our first speaker. Ann Pierce is an officer in both the Rawlings Society and the Friends of the Marjorie Kinnan Rawlings Farm. She has presented at a number of Year of the Yearling events. Her research of Rawlings and the novel led to a study of the history of the Long family. Today she'll make the connections for us between this family and the Yearling novel. So please welcome our first presenter today, Ann Pierce. Thank you. I know most of you and you know I can speak for much longer than 30 minutes, but I'll try to hold it to that. Um, let's see. Make sure we got all our stuff here. In the first few pages of the yearling, Rawlings makes clear that she's talking, that she's setting this wonderful novel in the big scrub. She has Jody run down the sand road to Silver Glen Springs, and he dreams away the afternoon and builds his flutter mill. We're hooked already just from those few, few paragraphs, I'm sure. The Reuben, farm, the Reuben family, Long family, settled this area in the 1870s. I hope to share with you their story and connect it to Rawlings' novel today. But first, let's go back just a little bit. Rawlings was working on her first novel, South Moon Under, and in connection with that, she interviewed and lived with the Piety and Leonard Fidia. Piety is Leonard's mother. They lived just north of Eureka 
along the Oklawaha River. She lived with them. She helped Leonard with his still. She helped Piety wash her, her quilts. She participated in their daily life and took many notes that are actually housed here in this facility. While she was there, neighbors visited, and among them, Cal Long. Cal Long was a hunter. He was up in age by then, but he, had, he was a wealth of stories, and they would sit around, I can just imagine, on the front porch listening to those stories and Marjorie taking mad notes after she went to bed. Uh, she promised Cal that she would come and visit him later and get some more stories. He, in fact, was the model for Old Man Payne in South Moon Under. South Moon Under was published in 1933 in the spring. It was set in the Big Scrub. Now, um, the Big Scrub, she describes as follows in South Moon Under. The Florida Scrub was unique. There was perhaps no region similar anywhere. It was a vast, dry, rectangular plateau bounded on three sides by two rivers, the Oklawaha flowing towards the north. This is the Oklawaha. Bounded it on the west. At the northwest corner of the rectangle, The Oklawaha turned sharply at right angles and flowed due east, joining at the northeast corner the St. Johns River, which formed the eastern demarcation. Within these watery bounds, uh, li these watery lines, the scrub stood aloof, uninhabited through its wider reaches. The growth repelled all human living. The soil was a tawny sand from which parched infertility there reared, indifferent to water, so dense a growth of scrub pine, the southern spruce, that the effect of the mass thin trunks was of a limitless canopied stockade. It seemed impenetrable for a man-high growth of scrub oak, myrtle, sparkleberry, and tie tie filled the interstices. Wide areas indeed admitted no human passage. In places, the pines grew more openly. The sunlight filtered through and patches of ground showed bald and lichened. The scrub was sparingly dotted with small lakes and springs, around which grew a damp loving hammock vegetation. Or a random patch of moisture produced alien to dryness a fine strand of slash pine or longleaf yellow. These were known as pine islands. To anyone standing on a rise, they were visible from a great distance. The scrub rolled towards its boundaries like a dark sea. It casts itself against the narrow beach of swamp and hammock that fringes the rivers. So this is our setting. And this marvelous map over here, I want you to look at more closely when you have a chance. I'll be referring to that in my slide several times. After the publication of her book, her editor, Max Perkins, wrote her that summer and said the following. He said, I simply was going to suggest that you do another book about a child in the scrub, which would be designed for what we call the younger readers. If you wrote about a child's life, either a boy or a girl or both, it would certainly be a fine publication. And such books have a, have a way of outdoing even the most successful novels in the long run. So he planted the seed for this novel, The Yearling. She indeed did go back to see Cal Long for a visit in October of 1933. Even though she was working on another novel, Golden Apples, she took time out to go over and get some more stories from him because she was fascinated by his, his life and the life of his family as they settled that area. His family first lived 
along Lake George here at Silver Glen, at Silver Glen Springs. Excuse me, I'm not used to working with mine. This is Pat's Island. They actually homesteaded on Pat's Island, and we'll get into the details of that in a little bit. And I want you to notice another island here, Hughes Island. Hughes Island is her setting for the, for the residents of the foresters in the yearling. She said that was about four miles uh, west of Pat's Island. The island was called by such a name in an arid forest because it was literally, and this is quoting from the yearling, it was literally an island of longleaf pines, lifted high, a landmark, in the rolling sea that was the scrub. There were other such islands scattered to the north and west where some accident of soil or moisture produced patches of luxuriant growth, even of hammock, the richest growth of all. Live oaks were the, here and there, the red bay and magnolia, wild cherry and sweet gum, hickory and holly. The map that we're referencing here was annotated by Rawlings in 1938. She gave it to MGM after she sold them the movie rights because she wanted them to get it right. And they really did for the most part. I want you to be sure to look at this closely. You can see it a little better on the one here. She talks about where the Baxters uh, said goodbye to the Hutos, um, uh, the, the Glen where Jody's flutter mill was and so forth. You'll enjoy looking at that, I'm sure. So let's, we want to explore just a little bit the origins of the yearling. I just talked a bit about Pat's Island. That was to be, that was uh, not, not Pat's Island specifically, but the scrub was the suggestion that, that um, Perkins made. Um, no doubt Pat's Island became her major setting because of the stories of Cal Long and his family. She visited there and took notes on the, the locations and so forth. Now, the rest, of this, the rest of the story, though, is what made her decide on the 1870s. I have to think that was because, indeed, that Long family did come there during that period. And I want to share with you some of their stories and their, their activities as they, they did settle the area. Excuse me. The question remains, why did she choose this theme? How did she get the idea for the story? And I hope you'll have a better idea of that as I unfold the rest of the Long family story. But the very kernel of the idea, I can't, we, we know how she got it because she said the following in a speech in 1943 after the novel's publication. She's quoted as saying, it was one of those April days, so beautiful you wanted to reach out and hold it so it would not move on and die. I was standing under a tree. The sun shone through the trees and the soft breeze caused the light and shadow around me to sift, shift and change. There was a stillness, a stillness that was like the stillness the day father died. He died in 1913 when she was 16. And with it came a feeling of ecstasy and regret a lifting sensation, but tinged with sadness. It was a definite premonition of maturity. Through the years, the thought of that April day, instead of becoming a dim memory, became more insistently poignant. I had thought of doing a short sketch based on the impression. It was stretched to a short story, and then when I came to Florida, the full significance of this premonition of maturity came to me, and I wrote The Yearling. Let's switch gears a bit now and get the backstory on the Long family. The Long family started off in North Carolina, Poway, North Carolina. Reuben was orphaned when he was 15. His family consisted of a number of children, some of them very young at that point, leaving his mother 
on a farm with small children. He helped there on the farm and lived with his mother until, in fact, even after he and Sarah Jane were married, they lived with his mother for a year or so. They themselves bought a small farm nearby and uh, they took in his brother Thomas. So Thomas became a member of their family almost immediately. They had two children, uh, Alonzo and Calvin, and their farm was not doing well. It was really hard to make a go on such a small piece of land and, and with uh, the hardships that they were enduring there. And they had heard of the promised land of Florida. There was land to be had, there were crops were easy to grow, oranges grew on trees. It was the promised land as far as he was concerned. And so he began to prepare to move his family to Florida. They uh, discussed with another neighboring family the trip and decided to go together. Um, Calvin was very young when they first started making these plans, so they decided they'd better wait until he was at least a year old so that they could make the trip more easily. So in 18, the fall of 1858, he had trained his oxen, and you'll remember from the yearling, uh, Penny talked about having done that before he moved to, to Baxter's Island. He had trained his oxen, he had some, some dogs, he had uh, various food provisions, and they had a wagon, and they set off from Poway. They camped along the way, they hunted and fished, and uh, uh, prepared their own food as they went. And they also, in the hunting, um, saved the skins. And when they got to Jacksonville, when they got to Jacksonville, they sold those skins and bought passage on a steamship. And I don't know exactly where they put the oxen, but that's the family story. Every, everything was loaded on the steamship, and they went towards the headwaters of the St. John's down to Mellonville. In Mellonville, they got off the ship, a steamboat rather, and they went to Chuliota, and that's where they decided to settle. They, there they grew oranges, and they grew oranges, hunted, and fished, and they sold their wares on the steamboats in Mellonville. In May of 1862, Reuben joined the Confederate Army. Now, I think it's important to note the family situation at this point. He was 30, and by the way, he was described as follows. Light complexion, light hair, blue eyes, five feet, four inches tall. Does that sound like somebody that you have an image of? Sounds like Penny, doesn't it? Small man. Sarah Jane was 25. She was pregnant again, by the way. And at that point, they had Thomas, who was 14. That was, Cal that was uh, Reuben's brother. Alonzo was eight, Calvin was five, and James was three. James died before the end of the year. Of, he had always been sickly, and we don't know just what he died of, but it was not a surprise to the family that he passed away. So just imagine trying to run a farm with really one young man who was 14. The other two were quite young, and she was to have another child immediately. Just as an aside, we know that in 1862 there was a very strong hurricane which destroyed crops and really left their farm in shambles. That same September, Reuben was injured at the Battle of Antietam and came home in October on furlough to recover. Now, I think it's kind of interesting too in terms of the parallels with the yearling. He came home, so he was there to, to work on the farm, but he was disabled. So he could direct things, but he couldn't really do much work himself. And we know that this was a situation with Penny Baxter and the yearling on a couple of occasions. By the way, 
Um, there was a strong hurricane, or perhaps not a hurricane, but a strong rainstorm, they call it, in 1871 in the big scrub area. So we don't know. It's probably a combination of those that Marjorie describes in the yearling. Thomas went, joined the Confederate Army in 1864. He was 16. Now, if you think about this a little bit, he left Alonzo 10, Cal 7, and Penny, the new baby, was 2, and the mother on the farm. So it's not surprising, well, let me finish Reuben's story. Reuben was captured towards the end of the war. He was released in October and started to walk home. And as he was walking home, he was walking home with others from Florida, apparently. When they got to South Carolina, they came upon a group of people by the side of the road. There were some children that were clearly, uh, had been born into slavery. They were slave children, uh, not any longer slaves, of course. But the, there were um, Union Army uh, personnel escorting these kids. And so the men that were walking home said, what, what's going on? What, what are you doing with these children? And they said, well, you know, they're orphans. I guess we're going to have to shoot them. We don't know what to do with them. There's nothing to do with them. And so Reuben and the other people walking along there going home to Florida said, wait a minute, we'll take them into our families. And so Reuben took in James Rogers. He was six. He said, you know, he's the same age as one of my kids. I'll just raise him with the rest of my kids. And the others were the same. Now, the only this is a family story from the family history, so we don't know any details, but James Rogers did live with the family for the rest of his life. Reuben came home, needless to say, to a failing farm. I mean, there had been nobody there for the last few years to take care of anything. The grove was in, in bad shape. There was looting in the area, political unrest, clan activity, and, of course, he had a growing family. By now, this was the family. He was 40 and Sarah Jane 35, and these are the children. And, of course, I'm including James Rogers in there as one of the children. Shortly after he came back from the war, Thomas Long married, and in fact, he married the daughter of the family that, that came with them to Florida. They had become very close and they lived in the same area. Thomas spent the rest of his life in the Chuliota area, but Reuben decided that he would move his family to the Lake George area. They happened to know some other families and friends from North Carolina who lived in this general area, not exactly where they moved to, but in the general area. They moved to here, and in fact, they moved there by building some rafts, loading everybody on the rafts, including the oxen, and poling down the St. John's River. I just can't imagine anything any more perilous than that. But that's the story. So they landed there along, the, along Lake George. There was another family in the general area, but it was fairly isolated. This is the Silver Glen Springs area before it was developed. They built themselves a house a log house as they had before with hand-hewn shingles. And they lived there from 1872 to 1877. During this time, they hunted and fished, had some small crops there, traded again with the steamboats that came by. Reuben, along this time, would wander up into the scrub, and 
he found a location that he wanted to move his family to. In 1876, he decided that it was time to move again, one last time, and he would move the family up to Pat's Island. Again, the family story goes that this time he said, this is gonna be my permanent residence, and so I'm gonna make it, instead of making it out of logs, as I have my other, other uh, dwellings here in Florida, I want to make it out of um, planed lumber. And so the story goes that he actually bought the lumber from Gainesville. Now, I cannot imagine all the transport that was needed to get lumber from Gainesville over to the big scrub. Even today, it would be a difficult task. But at any rate, the pictures that we have of him next to a building that was said to be his house, it is indeed plain lumber. It's not, um, it's not the logs that we saw in the other setting. Reuben's reasons for making this move may have been something like what Rawlings describes to us in The Yearling as Penny's reasons for coming to the scrub. She said, he had perhaps been bruised too often. The peace of the vast, aloof scrub had drawn him with the beneficence of, of, the, of its silence. Something in him was raw and tender. The touch of men was hurtful upon it, but the touch of pines was healing. Making a living came harder. Distances were troublesome in buying supplies and marketing of crops, but the clearing was particularly his own. The wild animals seemed less predatory to him than the people he had known. The forays of bear and wolf and wildcat and panther on stock were understandable, which was more than he could say of human cruelties. He had chosen his land as well as a man might in the brooding expanse of the scrawny sand pines. He had bought of the foresters who lived a safe four miles away, high good land in the center of a pine island. The scarcity of water was the only drawback to the location. The water level lay so deep that wells were priceless. Water for inhabitants of Baxter's Island must come until bricks and mortar were cheaper from the great sinkhole on the western boundary of the 100-acre track. So Reuben moves his family up there. His house was at, at least habitable by 1877. At that point, he was 45. He had no shortage of workers. He had a large family. He had three sons, 18 or older. Two additional sons were 11, and one was nine. The others were six and younger. Recall that Penny Baxter in The Yearling did not have this advantage. He had only one son who was 11 or 12. So it was really tough for him to do all of the manual labor that needed to be done on his farm. Perhaps Reuben Long is more like the Foresters then, to some extent. You remember the Foresters did have cattle, which Reuben Long had. They had pigs. They had, um, they took them to market occasionally. Uh, they were um, much more able. And you remember also when, I think it was Buck came to help out when Penny was uh, bitten by the snake, he said, gosh, I didn't realize that you were so hard put to, to live here. These were some of the activities that the family, that the, the men in the family probably took care of. Is that the plain lumber? Yes. Yes, it is. Uh -huh. Back behind it. Uh -huh. Two of his sons that we know a little bit about because Marjorie actually met and, and interacted with them are Melvin and Calvin. Melvin is said to be the child that had the deer. Now, there's several stories about the deer, and we really don't know which one is the accurate story of, of the events that really took place. 
Uh, Margaret Long tells us one version, but I'm inclined to go with the version that's found in Marjorie's notes right here in these hallowed halls. Here are her notes, and surely these were notes taken from her interviews with Cal Long. The pet deer, fawn raised, two years mischievous, came in house, got into everything, jumped on the table, ate grains of corn, planted corn, deer pulled it up, tried to fence, eight foot rail fence, 10 foot stakes and riders, deer jumped it. Now keep in mind, at least in the case of the longs, there were lots of sons around to run the deer off or to help out with the replanting and so forth, unlike Marjorie's story. Father sent Cal to kill deer, hated it. It was Melvin's deer, his younger, younger brother's deer. So this sounds like where the, the germ of that idea might have come. If she already had in mind trying to tell the story of a coming of age, this would probably have triggered something. Or at least upon looking back at the notes, perhaps. We don't want to leave out, leave out Sarah Jane. Sarah Jane, at the time they came to, Pat, to live on Pat's Island, was 40 years old. By this time, she had 10 children in her household, ranging from 23 to one. Just as a little bit of background, two of her children had died before this time. One, as I said, died in 1862. He, he had been sickly. He was three years old when he passed away. Thomas was born in, in 1867 and died in 1868. The family records say that he died of a cold. May have been pneumonia, we don't know. But he did not die as an infant. He, he was about one year old. Reuben, one of the twins, she had one set of twins, by the way, in this whole bunch, moved with them in 1877 to Pat's Island. In 1878, he was bitten by a snake and died of a snake bite. Another aspect of the story. So with the help of 15-year-old Penny, that was the only daughter that she had that was old enough to help her, she did these following tasks. And by the way, she had another child after she came to Pat's Island. The other child was born a year later in 1877. Well, two years later, I guess, 1870, uh, 1878 or nine, when she was 42. As I've said, water was an issue. It, it, was a, it paid a... a a central role, certainly, in the yearling, and it was indeed an issue on Pat's Island. You know, we're so fortunate that Pat's Island area, the whole scrub area, is, an, is a national forest, and many parts of it are quite pristine, particularly the, the uh, wilderness areas. So Pat's Island looks very much like it might have looked when Reuben moved there. We can still go to the sinkhole. The sinkhole apparently was more defined at that time, but it indeed is still there. It does not seep as it used to, but that was a source of water. Reuben chose to build a cistern next to his house, and we can still see the remnants of it when we, when we walk the trail there on Pat's Island. It was lined with bricks, and the water from the house shed into the cistern. Just behind his house, just uh, west and a little bit south of his house, is an ephemeral pond, which she would, which Sarah Jane and her family would use for washing quilts. Now, it's not always; it doesn't always contain water. The only well that was ever in. Um, on Pat's Island was a well that Calvin Long had somewhat later, and it was a real uh, issue to, to actually uh, 
build that well. There's a whole story associated with that. Here we see a diagram of the homesteads that were there. Notice Pat, uh, Patrick Smith has a homestead that encompasses sinkhole. He was the first one there. He came before, <laughs> before Reuben. Reuben has a pretty good spot, though, because he's close to the water. And you see the rest of them there. Um, there were, I, I hope somebody today will talk about the regulations associated with homesteading, but they did uh, choose to homestead here, so they owned the property and later sold it around 1900 or later. Um, just some of the family pictures. There's a picture of Calvin and his second wife. This, um, this cabin that you see is the cabin that the MGM people built for the movie, but it was patterned after the cabin that Calvin had on that property. And by the way, they used the site of his homestead for the, um, for the movie, and indeed that is where um, Rawlings set the um, homestead for the Baxters. This is um, Alonzo Long's family, just to give you an example of, of a family from that era. He, this is his second wife. His first wife died after one year in childbirth. I mean, it's, it's the stories that we hear over and over of that era. The Long Family Cemetery is still there. If you go to the area, please read the gravestones. They tell many stories. A child, was, a child who's, who's um, clothes caught on fire by, by the fireplace and someone else who, you know, I mean, Rawling certainly used some of this in her, in her uh, work as well. Sarah Jane died in um, 1909. And I think it's, it's quite, it, she was 72 years old at that time. On her gravestone is the following, an affectionate wife, a kind mother, and a friend to all. This is not Ori Baxter, is it? This is not who she's talking about. This is more like Grandma Huto or, or more like Ma Forrester. But indeed, an interview with one of the family members, one of her grandchildren, reinforces this as, as her nature. Reuben died in 1915. Um, he was said to be a very active man, even into his old age, and he was 83 when he died. And both of these ages are pretty advanced for people of that era. Pat's Island today, and I think um, the person that introduced me alluded to this when he gave the introduction. Marjorie characterized her work as follows. Just as music is only music when it is heard, so characters in a book only come to life when the reader takes them to heart. I believe that miracle, quite beyond my control, has happened to some characters in The Yearling. I think Penny and Jody Baxter are alive. They happen to be alive for me more so, I think, than any character I've ever tried to draw. More so, although they are entirely fictitious. In many uh, that more, more so than many characters I have drawn straight from life. They are so real to me that when I go to the abandoned clearing in the isolated portion of the, of the callous scrub, there's where in imagination I laid the scenes of the yearling, I look for them. I hope these characters will be alive to you after what you hear today in this entire seminar, because we'll know a lot about this region and life in that time by the end of the day. These are some of my references. If you're interested in a complete bibliography, I'll be glad to give it to you afterwards. I do want to mention that on March 1st, I'll be taking a guided walk through this area of the, the homesteads and so forth of the Longs and referencing the sites that are mentioned in the yearling. If you want, if you're interested in that, the details are listed in the newsletter of the friends that's found on the back uh, page, on the back table. That's it. Thank you. Well, uh, if you have any questions for Ann Pierce, we'll be again asking questions at the end of the afternoon, so please uh, save your questions for then, and, and uh, uh, we'll look forward to the, that discussion.
Right now, it is my pleasure to introduce Ben DiBiase. He is Educational Resources Coordinator for the Florida Historical Society and Archivist at the Library of Florida History in Cocoa. He's a regular contributor to Florida Frontiers, the weekly radio magazine of the Florida Historical Society. Ben is currently editing a new book, French Florida, a narrative based on the earliest accounts, an unpublished 1933 English translation of a manuscript by Charles de la Ranciere. Uh, today, Ben will be discussing other hidden gems from the Florida Historical Society archive that deal with Marjorie Kinnan Rawlings and the yearling. Please welcome Ben DiBiase. Okay, good morning. Everyone hear me all right? Uh, I want to first uh, thank Florence Turcott and, and everyone else involved with uh, this symposium for, for extending the invitation. Uh, this, this really is a great honor to, to be speaking with some uh, very esteemed colleagues in the, in the Florida history field and, and those involved with, uh, with the Rawlings Society. Um, as Dr. Brokmarkel pointed out, I, I work as the Educational Resources Coordinator and the Archivist for the Florida Historical Society Library. Uh, and for the last four years, this has really been my dream job. I get an opportunity to uh, not only work with, but to arrange, catalog, uh, digitize, and, and identify a lot of, of as Dr. Brokmarko put it, these hidden gems in Florida history, um, and a few of which I'm going to talk about today. I really wasn't aware of this collection um, until just recently when we were searching for, for a, a segment for the Florida Frontiers um, radio program. And I happened to stumble across a, uh, a note in the Florida Historical Quarterly, our academic journal, about Marjorie Kinnan Rawlings and her uh, involvement with the Florida Historical Society. She was a member for, for quite a while. So we started digging around and, and came across um, a number of letters, some correspondence records, and also an old journal, uh, journal rather. And that's what I'm going to talk a little bit about today. It was a farm journal, uh, dates from about 1853 to 1872. Uh, that Rawlings uh, used as, as sort of a, a, a backdrop for, uh, for parts of the yearling. Uh, but before I get to the uh, details of the journal, I want to talk a little bit about the Florida Historical Society. I don't know how many of um, you all are familiar with the organization, uh, but it's actually one of the oldest cultural organizations that still exists in the state of Florida. Uh, it began back in 1856 in St. Augustine um, as the State Historical Society of Florida. Uh, and essentially it was uh, what we call kind of an antiquarian society. It was a group of um, influential white men who got together to talk about the, the great and grand history of our state. Uh, and they uh, worked to sort of compile the, the great man histories. And, and, um, but they also were, were interested in preserving a lot of documents, mostly related to early colonial history in Florida. Um, the organization disbanded during the Civil War, so after Florida seceded, um, the organization essentially uh, broke up. Uh, but later in the 19th century, a number of the uh, early members uh, still continued to collect uh, manuscripts, uh, books, documents, and, and house them in their private libraries. And then at the turn of the century, in 1902, the organization reorganized, uh, officially reorganized, and then in 1905, we incorporated as the Florida Historical Society. So the organization that exists today uh, can really trace its roots directly to that incorporation in 1905. Uh, and that actually happened in, in Jacksonville. Um, the headquarters have, have moved around the state. Our library collection has moved around the state. It's grown, it's shrank over time. Uh, the influence around the state has grown and, and, and diminished over time. Uh, currently, we're housed uh, uh, in, a, in a private library, actually in Cocoa, in, down in Brevard County, in an old uh, WPA-era post office building. So we're actually housed in a really beautiful historic site. Uh, so I encourage anyone who's interested in Florida history, please come down to, uh, to visit us there. And the mission of FHS, I put this up just to give you an idea of, of you know, what we are currently trying to do. Again, we, we are continuing with the, the, uh, the first uh, initiatives of our founders, right, to collect and preserve uh, documents and materials that relate to uh, our state's history, uh, but we're also really working to um, publish and, and uh, uh, disseminate that information. So our, our initiatives now really focus on educational outreach, um, uh, and, but also on preservation. So we're still sort of linked to our roots as a as an archive, and, and our, our goal really is to, to preserve uh, the, the history and understand and analyze the history of, of the state of Florida. Um, I want to focus particularly on one decade, the 1930s to about the early 1940s. Uh, and this is when uh, Marjorie Kinnan Rawlings was actually most active in the society. Um, 
during this period, the, the society really experienced a, a tremendous amount of growth. Um, the membership, uh, membership in the society in the 1930s was about 300, but by the end of the decade it had swelled to over 800 members statewide. Uh, there were annual meetings, there were uh, um, district meetings that were held around the state. So there really was a concerted effort to turn the organization into a statewide historical society, uh, but also uh, produce scholarly works that are, uh, and promote scholarly works that are related to, directly to the state's history. Um, and again, this was a, a, the, 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 the efforts of a lot of our, our early members, presidents, and libraries, and secretaries. And I have a few of, the, uh, a few of the, the names you may recognize, and we've worked in Florida history. We have uh, P.K. Young, Julian Young, um, A.J. Hanna, Karita Doggett Course, who was the state director of the Federal Writers Project for the WPA in the 1930s. Um, Joshua Chase, our, our president, and Marjorie Kinnon Rawlings, who actually served as a director for the society in 1941, 1941-42. Um, but the first name uh, you may not recognize, this is Watt Marchman, uh, but he's a really interesting character and he's, he's key to this story when we talk about the relationship between FHS and, and Rawlings. Watt Marchman was the uh, corresponding secretary and was the, the librarian for the Florida Historical Society. And he came on in the early 1930s. He was actually a graduate student at Rollins College um, and started working, volunteering with the society, eventually uh, um, secured a, a paid position as a librarian. Um, but his main goal, his focus, was to expand the library's collection as much as possible. Um, and it was actually Marchman who really initiated some of the first contact with Rawlings. Uh, as we heard earlier, Rawlings had already produced a couple of works uh, centered around uh, some Florida history topics, South Moon Under, um, Golden Apples was actually published in, in the mid-1930s. So um, he had read the works and understood the importance, the historical significance and importance of a lot of these, non, these fictional literary works. Uh, so he actually wrote to, to Rawlings, and we have a, a copy of the original letter, and he had asked for, um, possibly for signed copies of the books, just to start out. He said, you know, we, we uh, would love to uh, make our, uh, get our members sort of aware of a lot of your work if they aren't already. Um, and we'd like to have you more involved in the society. So it was Marchman really who um, extended that, that first invitation and really got the discourse going between, uh, between Rawlings. Um, and that brings me to, to Marjorie Kinnon Rawlings herself. Uh, according to our, our institutional records, the earliest um, uh, membership uh, records that we could find show that, that Rawlings jo actually joined the society in 1936. Um, sometime between November of, of 1936 and January of 37, she's listed as a new member, Marjorie Kinnon Rawlings, uh, Hawthorne, Florida. Um, she actually spoke frequently at a number of our annual meetings uh, every year, and, and the society continues to hold annual meetings around the state, but as early as the 1920s, we were still traveling around and having uh, annual meetings and symposiums, which focused on various aspects of Florida history. And Rawlings participated in a number of these, a number of these events. Now, of course, her, her topic was generally the same. It was how to include historical uh, topics into fictional works, right? A very broad kind of a biggest theme, but, um, but it's really interesting. And, and she was probably the best person at the time uh, to speak about this. And we, and we heard Anne talk a lot about the, the historical connection. She had done her research. Um, you know, it's clear that through uh, not only the oral histories, but some of her documentary research, um, she captured life in the 1870s, probably better than most, uh, most researchers at the time, professional historians at the time. She really did put a lot of effort into um, creating the, the, the life of, of Florida and the environment of Florida in the 1870s. And that's really evident with, with the correspondence record. She was very, very detailed uh, in what she looked for. She spent a lot of time at the library. Um, the library at the time had, was, was moving between St. Augustine and Jacksonville, then back to St. Augustine. Uh, but the, but I said the li like I said, the library was uh, growing and expanding rapidly, and she was utilizing a lot of these sources. It was actually during this time that the Society ac acquired a number of our, um, our manuscript collections and original document collections, which she utilized for, for later works and for articles. Um, and as I mentioned before, Rawlings actually served as a director of the Florida Historical Society, and she's listed uh, in the, the roles from 1941 to 42. Um, the collection that, that we house at the Historical Society uh, that we call the, the Marjorie Kinnon Rawlings Correspondence Collection um, really only dates from about 36 to 42. After 1942, 1943, um, there's very little correspondence and, and you know, we can really only speculate as to why that was. 
uh, you know, may have been wrapped up with, with the, some of the libel suits and other issues that she was having, um, but we're not really sure. So, so after about 1943, uh, it, it's possible that she remained a member. We'd have to do a little bit more research to find out. Um, but it was really during this period, from 36 to 43, that she was heavily involved in the society, um, and that's evidenced through the, uh, through the collections. Um, this is a great example of, of one of the letters from, uh, from Rawlings. So after Marchman had sort of solicited uh, uh, copies of, of some of her earlier books, uh, she mentions, yes, I'd be happy to speak briefly at the meeting in St. Augustine. Um, but she also says that you know, she, she'll uh, probably wait and won't give the, because Marchman really wanted to advertise her as the speaker. You know, he, was, he was smart. You know, he was more of a marketer, too. He knew what he was doing. He wanted uh, you know, a big name in Florida history to come and, and headline this, this event. Um, so he tried to get her, he always tried to get her to be the keynote speaker for every event. And through, other, through various letters, she's always trying, saying, well, I'll, I'll give an informal talk about you know, using history in, in, uh, in fiction. Uh, it was always essentially the same talk. Um, but she always drew a crowd. Uh, and there were a number of letters uh, from, the, uh, from the board of directors and from members writing to Rawlings, thanking her for, for, her, uh, for her speech and for her time. And she was always the most popular and most talked about of the, of the speakers. Uh, this is one of, uh, an example of one of the letters from, from Marchman. Um, and he's actually congratulating her on, on the tremendous response that the Yearling, which was just published, is receiving. And again, he was a real booster of, of Florida history and, and the society. And, and um, they actually tried to work out a deal with uh, her publisher, with Scribner's, to get um, discounted copies uh, out to, to their membership. Uh, and, and there's a evidence of, of that working, although it didn't really work out. They essentially refused and said, the price is the price. Uh, but, uh, but, but he tried. Um, let's move on. And another journal. This brings me, to, uh, we're starting to get into the farm journal, right, which is really the, the center of, of the talk today. And I talked a little bit about the use of primary documents. Um, Marjorie Kinnon Rawlings had come across a farm journal sometime in the, in the early 1930s. And like I said, the farm journal covered the period from uh, 1853 to about 1872. Uh, and essentially, it's a, a very standard journal that you would find from the 19th century. It's a list of day-to-day -day activities on a plantation in central Florida. Um, and there was also listed uh, uh, prices of goods that were purchased, um, you know, at later dates. There are a number of, of names of neighbors. Uh, I didn't go into a whole lot of detail about, uh, you know, narrative detail about daily life, um, but a lot of essentially just bullet points uh, that point, well, today, plow the field. Uh, tomorrow, plow the field. <laughs> Next day, probably plow the field. Um, but but it, it hints at some of the, the hardships that a lot of these early settlers um, uh, essentially had to go through. Um, let me back up a little bit. This is actually a copy uh, of the, uh, the yearling. This is a first edition copy of the yearling. Uh, Rawlings sent uh, a first edition copy of every published book that she published up to that point. But inside each copy, she would write, uh, she would inscribe a, a personalized note to the Florida Historical Society. And it's a little bit difficult to read her writing here, but what she's doing is um, essentially giving a, a brief synopsis of the yearling. So here we have Marjorie Cannon Rawlings writing to the society and giving her quick abstract of what the book is about. You know, what, what, a book that would become one of the most you know, famous and well-known pieces of, of Florida literature ever produced. Um, and this is her very quick and, and succinct description of, of this really incredible work. Uh, of course, it's signed Marjorie Kennan Rawlings. And like I said, she did this with, with all of her works. We have a, a copy of uh, South Moon Under uh, and Golden Apples that also include this, this quick synopsis and this analysis of each, of each work. And you'll see here she writes that um, uh, the members of the society will be um, happy you know, to know that, that um, although the characters are fictional, um, she went to great pains, essentially, to, uh, to make the book as historically accurate as she possibly could. Uh, this brings me to the, to the actual journal. The photograph we're looking at is, a, is an excerpt from uh, the Florida Historical Quarterly. Uh, some of the early quarterlies listed uh, donations that were made to the Society's library. And listed at the bottom, you see uh, South Moon Under, Golden Apples by Marjorie Kinnon Rawlings. And then at the very bottom it says, let me get the point of, Florida Plantation Record Book, 1853 to 1872. It's inscribed Thomas L. Williamson's book, presented by Marjorie Kinnon Rawlings. Uh, this is from volume uh, 16, I believe, of the quarterly, number four, uh, which would have been 1938, 1939, when she actually donated, uh, donated the book. Although she'd been talking about it for a while in, in correspondence with Marchman, 
uh, promising to, to donate the book when she was finished with it. Uh, she eventually did uh, bring the original copy to the society and presented it to, uh, to the library in 30, late 38, early 39. Um, like I said, it covers a period from about November of 53 to November of 1873. Uh, although a number of pages are missing, uh, there are gaps in years. Um, it jumps from about 1862 to 65, uh, and there's probably obvious reasons for that. Uh, there was a little bit of a little bit of a, a war going on, um, and it's it's essentially, like I said, a, a list of of the day-to-day uh, -day activities of, of farm life. So from about 1853 up until the war years, to about 1861, it's a very detailed list of of what the uh, what Williamson and his family. Uh, what they were involved in uh, as far as day-to-day -day work and activities during that time period. There's also a number of, uh, of um, uh, neighbors' names that are listed, you know, helped out Mr. Smith's farm and so-and-so. Um, but we were able to find a little bit out about, about Mr. Williamson. Williamson is not a, a native Floridian. Like a lot of, of these early uh, settlers, he actually moved here uh, from up north. Williamson was born in, uh, uh, on April 21st of 1817 in South Carolina. We're not exactly sure where. Uh, but he moved down to Florida after uh, he was married in, uh, to Catherine Schuler. Um, and I put here they were married uh, in 1821. They're actually married in, in 1841. But they moved down to Florida sometime in the early 1850s. Again, this is the only record book that we have for that plantation. Um, it's likely the only record book because it covers such a, a, a broad uh, time range. Um, so they, it was probably sometime just prior to, to 1853 that they moved down to um, uh, what is now Marion County along a lake called Lake Kerr. And some of you may be familiar with this. Lake Kerr is actually uh, within the Ocala National Forest and kind of the eastern edge of, of Marion County. Um, when, they, when they moved here, they had um, three sons at the time who were teenagers. Um, but they actually, his wife Catherine gave birth to ten children majority of whom did not survive into adulthood. So out of the 10 children, they had four that survived into, into adulthood, and only one child who actually uh, had children that, that survived into adulthood. Um, there was a, uh, they had a daughter who never married, and they had a son who never married, but lived into the 20th century. Um, they established this small plantation. When I say plantation, um, it, it sort of evokes this, this large-scale operation. Um, it was probably very small. The, the, the um, structure couldn't have been you know, more than, you know, they probably acquired a few hundred acres um, from the original uh, uh, homestead rolls. It looks like it was only about 200 to 300 acres that they first occupied, but they were probably um, some of the first people to really land and settle in, in this area. Uh, this is actually a, uh, a section of an 1885 uh, plat map that sounds in the society's collection. And it's showing here uh, Lake Kerr. If you look up here in the, the north end of the lake, uh, there's a name here, Lucy Williamson. Um, and it actually says Lucy Williams, but it's supposed to be Lucy Williamson. This was the, um, the area of, of the plantation, the Williamson plantation. Um, John Williamson had died by 1882. Uh, the, uh, the property was then handed over to his wife, Catherine, uh, who applied for a, for a homestead. Um, certificate for the property in 1883. She died in 1885. Uh, Lucy at the time was, um, I believe, the oldest surviving uh, of, of the, the original 10 children, and she's actually the only one who had children. Um, so it's likely she took over the, the, uh, the plantation home because, again, she was the oldest and, and inherited the property and also had children to raise. Um, let's move on a little bit. This is a, a copy from the um, uh, general land office records of that 1880, uh, 1883 uh, patent application. Uh, so it's actually in the name of Catherine Williams, um, widow of, of Thomas S. Williamson, uh, who was deceased by this time. Like I said, he had died in, in 1882. Um, a little bit more about Williamson. We know that, that Thomas actually served in the Civil War. Um, and again, it probably helps to explain the gap in years from 62 to 65. Um, he and his two oldest sons served in the war although his two oldest sons were both killed. Uh, whether they were killed in action or where they were killed, we're not really sure. It would take a little bit more research to, to sort of uncover that. But we obviously know that, that uh, the father, Thomas, came back. He was in his 40s at the time, um, so we're, we're really not sure if maybe they were assigned to different regiments. Uh, his sons, uh, being younger, probably served um, you know, somewhere in, in the, the northern campaigns and, and were killed, killed on the battlefield and probably buried there. Thomas is actually buried in Marion County. 
Um, there's a small settlement. Let me go back to the map. There's a small settlement on the north end of the lake called Kerr City, and some of you may be familiar with that. It's now essentially a ghost town. Uh, but there was a post office there, and, and after the war, it was kind of a thriving, a thriving town. There's a cemetery there as well, and most of the Williamson family is buried there. There are a few exceptions. Um, uh, well, I say exceptions. They're probably all buried there, but there are a few that, that uh, markers no longer exist. Um, so of, of the, the existing uh, grave markers, we know that the majority of the, of the families there, including uh, the elder Thomas S. Williamson, uh, after he had died in, in 1882. Um, now this is a, uh, uh, the only scan. I only made one scan of it because uh, the, the book itself is actually in very fragile condition. This is what the original uh, day book looks like, or the farm journal or farm book, whatever you want to call it. Um, and this is covering the date from uh, about January 1858, um, the month of January. And as you can see, it's, it's uh, again, listed by dates. So we have January 1st. There's a brief description of what was going on that day uh, up through the, the, the uh, looks like the 27th. Another issue with this journal, it's not in chronological order. He sort of jumped all over the place. Uh, you know, Williamson would, would put in a note here for January, uh, but the page before could have been February of the, the year prior. So it really was all over the place. It was, it was more of sort of a notepad than a formalized journal. It's, uh, as you can see, not lined. Um, the, the book itself is about the size of a, a eight and a half by 11 sheet, you know, piece of paper. It's really not that large. Um, uh, but a lot of the writing has been preserved. You know, what hasn't uh, deteriorated or, or been torn off from the original book has been preserved, and there's really a wealth of information. Um, when, the, when the book came to the society in the 1930s, uh, the librarian, Marchman, decided that uh, he would transcribe the entire book. He understood that there was some historical importance in uh, those who were interested in the yearling uh, would probably be interested in, in sort of learning more about uh, some of the families that, that uh, Rawlings would have based this, the, the story on. Uh, so he decided to sit down and transcribe the entire work. Um, he did that in, in uh, well, here's another page of the, uh, this is a later page from the, from the book. You can see it's in pencil. Um, and again, some of it's uh, very hard to, to read and distinguish, and, and it's uh, faded quite a bit. Um, but he decided to, to transcribe the original, uh, the original text, and he did so. It took him almost a year to finish. Uh, and when you look at the, the type transcription that Marshman did, it's absolutely incredible. There are a lot of, whenever there's a, uh, a notation in ink, you know, or there's a line, uh, Marshman would put that line. So it's really an exact facsimile um, using the, the technology of 19, uh, late 1930s, 1940s. So it's typewritten, but he used essentially a pen to, to replicate every mark that was put in this book. So it's really a true representation of, of the book itself. Um, and as, as soon as he did make this transcription, he was immediately uh, approached by uh, people who lived in the area and also people who were searching for descendants from the area. Um, one woman uh, by the name of uh, Mrs. Ott, I believe it was A. Ott as, in the letters, uh, and she was searching for a, a Civil War veteran who had come back to Florida and was buried somewhere in the area around Lake Kerr, uh, and she wanted to find any sort of reference in the farm book. She actually did. Um, but what's interesting, and this is where the story really gets interesting, um, when, when Marchman had, had made these transcriptions and he sent them out to, to various people, including Mrs. Ott, she happened to give it to, uh, to a gentleman or show it to a gentleman by the name of um, V.L. Hastings, Vance LaRue Hastings. Uh, and Vance was looking at this book and he happened to, to open up the front page and, and see the transcription that said Farm Journal uh, from uh, Thomas Williamson. And he noticed that name. Thomas Williamson was his grandfather. Uh, so the grandson of, of Thomas S. Williamson had actually now uh, found this book. He had no idea that it existed. Uh, and there's an interesting letter. I'll see if we can find it. This is a letter dated April 11th, 1941, to Watt Marchman from Vance Rue Hastings. Uh, and he says, essentially, he's explaining what I just said. I've got this manuscript from R.V. Ott. Um, she was trying to find a gentleman. Uh, yada, yada, yada. Then it gets down to the bottom. And he says, naturally, I do not want the original, uh, as it should be preserved in the archive. Um, he said, but I would be interested, however, in knowing how the original came to the possession uh, of this book of my grandfather's. He said, I'm glad that some thoughtful person has turned it over to the proper guardians, uh, but have a natural curiosity to know what devious route it arrived there. <laughs> so, he, you know, I don't know if any of the archivists here in the room has run into that. You know, you have uh, someone who may have a personal connection to a document and may be concerned as to, well, how did you acquire this document? Um, 
And Marston actually wrote back with a, a, a very uh, nice letter, which I haven't scanned. I have a copy of it here. Uh, but he simply said, well, the book came to us from a woman named Marjorie Cannon Rawlings, and she used it as a backdrop for her book, The Yearling. So Hastings actually contacted Rawlings directly. And we have, um, there's a copy of, of a letter that he, that Mar uh, Rawlings wrote to his wife, Helen Hastings, explaining in detail how she found the book. And that's how, that's really the only record that we have. Um, that gives any detail as to how she, how she originally came across the book. The story is that uh, Rawlings was fishing on Lake Kerr uh, with some friends and, and uh, came upon this dilapidated old home, this log home, uh, and they were searching for fresh water. So they came ashore, noticed no one was there. In fact, Rawlings mentions that she doesn't even think there was a door, a front door on the property. She walks in, they're searching around, and there were papers, she says, everywhere, old farm journals. Uh, somehow they ended up in the attic. And that's where she found the original journal. She started flipping through this farm book, noticed what it was, started reading some of the dates, and decided that um, you know, it was probably safer in, in, in her possession uh, rather than out you know, essentially in the elements. So she took the book with her. Um, and she mentions using, uh, and this is really the only uh, uh, explicit you know, uh, remarks that we have from Rawlings as to how she used the book. Uh, in the book, when, uh, when Ma Baxter essentially is um, giving a list of groceries that they wanted the, the, the neighbor to buy, there's a list in 1872 of, of some of the groceries and how much they cost uh, that, that uh, uh, Thomas Williamson essentially was, was um, trading and bartering between neighbors, and there's a list of a lot of these items. It's a very detailed list, and it's actually one of the few pages that's very well preserved, uh, and she writes that that's probably um, that's, that's essentially what she used it for directly. And like I said, she wrote directly to, to Mr. Hastings and I think kind of helped to, to settle him down a little bit. Uh, and then there was a, a kind of a lively correspondence between the two. Apparently they, they talked for quite a while um, after that and, and Rawlings again um, did stay connected with society, continued to speak with FHS. Um, uh, but, uh, but that's essentially the story of how the journal got here. Now, uh, it was sort of buried in the archives of the last few decades and, and we've actually been able to find it and uh, uh, this summer, actually, we have a plan to, to digitize the original book and the transcription. Uh, so we'll have those available through the Florida Historical Society's um, uh, digital website through our Past Perfect interface. Um, so researchers will be able to, uh, to access the original without necessarily having to, to access the archive. So um, I believe that's about the, the time that I have. If anyone's interested, I did bring a few copies of some of these, uh, the more interesting letters. Uh, so, so please uh, come and approach me, and I'd be happy to be happy to accommodate anyone who would like to visit the archive and see the original. It's there um, five days a week uh, down in Coco. So uh, again, thank you all very much for the invitation. Thank you for your time. Appreciate it. All right, thanks. And again, if you have uh, more, uh, questions for Ben, we'll be having a question and answer session uh, at, at the at end of the afternoon. Uh, next, though, we have a, another wonderful presenter, Connie Lester. Connie Lester is an associate professor in the Department of History at the University of Central Florida. She is also editor of the Florida Historical Quarterly, the Journal of the Florida Historical Society, and she's the director of Riches, the regional initiative for collecting the history, experiences, and stories of Central Florida. Dr. Lester is an historian of the rural and agricultural South, and her work focuses on small farm agriculture. She was the associate editor for the Tennessee Encyclopedia of History and Culture. She is author of Up From the Mud Sills of Hell, The Farmers Alliance, Populism, and Progressive Agriculture in Tennessee, 1870 to 1915, and 14 articles and chapters in books. She is currently editing the Civil War Diaries of Lucy Virginia French, the opportunity to examine depictions of subsistence farming in the writings of Marjorie Kinnan Rawlings drew her to today's presentation. Please join me in welcoming Connie Lester. I don't have a, a PowerPoint presentation talking about um, talking about historians and how they have uh, viewed agriculture in this period of time doesn't really lend itself to slides. Uh, be a lot of, uh, uh, of historians buried in archives and libraries, and that, that doesn't uh, lend itself to pictures. Um, I should tell you, though, that um, we have published two articles recently 
on Marjorie Kennan Rawlings, and both of those articles, one of which was written by Flo Turcott, both of those articles won the Thompson Award, which is the award for the best article on in Florida history published in the Florida Historical Quarterly. So uh, Marjorie Kennan Rawlings has gotten a lot of attention uh, from the journal itself. Okay. In the concluding pages of The Yearling, Jody Baxter returns home stripped of his romanticism, a man ready to take the heavy part of the burden from his father, whose considerable strength was ebbing rapidly. As sleep overcame him on his first night home, he called out for the beloved yearling, both dear and boy, now gone forever. In the plaintive cry for flag, Jody acknowledges the passing of his boyhood and the burden of adulthood that he must manage alone. The coming of age story resonates with Floridians not only for its literary value, but because it touches on the shared memories of fathers and grandfathers who struggle to gain power over nature and establish farms and groves among Florida's pal uh, palmettos and pines. The tale of the fictional Baxters uh, rings true because Marjorie Kennan Rawlings paid close attention to the environment that surrounded her home at Cross Creek and the hard lives of her neighbors. Like the Baxters, the community at Cross Creek was populated by subsistence farmers, men and women who cultivated the soil to produce food and fiber for their families, selling only the surplus to anonymous markets. Some of these farm families had lived in the area for generations, and had been, and while others had been lured to the peninsula in the aftermath of the Civil War, by the expectation of land under the provisions of the Southern Homestead Act. Florida and Louisiana are the states that, um, that receive the most um, people under that act. Or to make good on promises of easy wealth that any man could claim through the production of citrus. Regardless of the circumstances that placed them in Florida, everyone except for the most highly capitalized started with subsistence farming, and many never made the transition to the riskier but more prof profitable commercial production. The yearling follows the work, home, and community service act uh, uh, and community activities of the Baxter family over the transformative years of this year of the son's life, a year that incidentally provides readers with several insights into aspects of subsistence agriculture in 1870s Florida. Insights that incidentally reflect the historiographical debates within agricultural and economic history, rural social history, and gender history. First, economic history marginalizes subsistence farmers because their adherence to older, more traditional economies isolate them from the emerging cash-based ca cash capitalist structures. However, agricultural and, and environmental historians include subsistence farmers in their studies of the complex webs of rural exchanges that characterize that economy. These historians focus on the environmental integrity of agricultural diversity that was the hallmark of subsistence agriculture. Without hard-earned knowledge of the flora and fauna that define the scrub, subsistence agriculture would have been impossible. Harvesting the fruits of native plants, hunting and trapping birds and animals, and fishing in the local rivers sustained families for much of the year and provided meat and furs to sell to merchants at crossroads stores and to buyers on passing steamboats. Second, historians of rural society study both the isolation of widely dispersed subsistence farms and the social networks that enabled their survival. 
Subsistence farming was isolating and simultaneously dependent on networks of friends and kin who exchanged labor, tools, and knowledge outside cash-based markets. Exchange networks provided the difference between hunger and loss and the ability to survive poor harvest, illness, and both man-made and environmental adversities. Third, historians of gender argue that although gender roles for families engaged in subsistence agriculture demonstrated the essential work of both men and women, the practical often overwhelmed idealized notions of separate spheres. The work of farm women was taxing and essential, and they saw themselves as capable partners in the family farm. Important differences existed, however, the work performed by men provided opportunities for social interaction with other farmers, whereas the tasks for women uh, often left them isolated in their homes and kitchens. Evidence for the pervasiveness of subsistence farming can be found in the statistical data, the letters and diaries of the era, and the literature like The Yearling. The 1880 U.S. Census reports uh, record farms in Florida that averaged 141 acres, a size that seems to belie the suggestion that most farmers practiced subsistence agriculture. On closer examination, the data shows that the average acreage under cultivation was a mere 30 acres, a number that is consistent um, in most counties including Alachua, Marion, and Volusia. The range of settlement in those three counties does not change the fact that the average farm size was about 140 acres and the average uh, size of the land cultivated was about 30 acres. In 1880, there were 240 farms in Volusia County. Um, there were 1,400 or more than 1,400 in Alachua County. The cultivation of small acreages was generally associated with diverse production that included row crops, livestock, and kitchen gardens. Subsistence agriculture was the common heritage for Florida, not simply the unusual past of the dwellers of the scrubland. Word of mouth and widely circulated pamphlets promised migrants to Florida that cultivation of only a few acres of citrus would provide a more substantial return on their investment than commercial crops elsewhere. Evidence suggests that although larger growers dominated the total production of citrus, most citrus producers cultivated smaller groves. Indeed, as, as late as the 1900, uh, 1920, the record from the Winter Haven Citrus Cooperative shows that the average a uh, producer had only 10 acres in citrus. Even as they planted orange trees, the would-be citrus kings joined already established Floridians in subsistence agriculture. As they waited for their trees to bear fruit, growers provided for their families and paid their taxes through subsistence farming. If they were lucky and they didn't lose their trees to wildlife or weather or their own lack of knowledge, the period of subsistence was relatively short. But most far Florida farmers well into the 20th century rose only to the level of marginal commercial producers and many retained the production strategies used by subsistence farmers. In 1875, Indianan Henry Austin caught Florida fever and joined his nephew in the migration south. Letters to his family highlight the small size of, his, of 1870 farms and the use of subsistence strategies in the effort to establish commercial agriculture. Austin arrived in Jacksonville in May and took a steamer up the St. Johns River to Mellonville. His first view, first view of oranges was a 10-acre grove on the road to Fort Reed. 
In his search for land, he set out on a trek that took him 20 miles south to Orlando before un undertaking a second trip to Titusville. On both journeys, he, ex he described hospitality at cabins that mimicked the Baxter farm. Like Penny, the men tilled the soil and hunted to provide subsistence to their fam for their families. He met a farmer on the way to Titusville um, who ha had just uh, shot some game and he was uh, taking it uh, to the next town in order to sell the hide and the meat. Um, when he learned that they were on their way east, um, he invited them to spend the night as, at his cabin, which must have been a surprise to his wife who was there at the cabin alone. Uh, but she invited them in. Um, th Henry Austin records that he was a little bit unnerved by this. You know, it's only a one-room cabin. It did have two beds. Uh, he slept in one and she slept in the other, and he was a little unnerved about being in the cabin with this lone farm wife um, uh, all by themselves and the husband away. Uh, but he was grateful for the night he was, he was there. Austin finally decided on 40 acres for homesteading in Volusia County. Uh, though he had to wait a few weeks until he turned 21 to file his claim. Like other farmers in the area, he learned through hard-earned experience, and he depended on a network of neighbors for advice and labor in clearing the land, constructing buildings uh, on the land, and laying the foundation for commercial success. His first cash crop was pineapple, which succumbed to freeze. He started over, and then he started over again before achieving any success, and that was not unusual for farmers. On her 80th birthday, Henry Austin's widow recalled those year, early years, the struggle to cultivate the land and the small farms that dotted the area. Penny Baxter established his farm on a hammock of temperate hardwoods in the Florida scrub. He chose the land for establishing his farm based on the folk wisdom of the time. Without the benefit of soil science, he studied the trees that grew on the land as a way of assessing potential soil fertility. A now discredited method, it had been used by American farmers since the colonial era to predict their agricultural success. In her close observation of the scrub environment, Rawlings understood that the trees were a false promise. Quote, the Florida scrub was unique, she wrote in South Moon Under. There was perhaps no similar region anywhere. The soil was tawny sand, from whose parched infertility there reared, indifferent to water, so dense a growth of scrub pine that the effect of the mass thin trunks was of a limitless canopied stockade. Indeed, she noted, wide areas admitted no human passage. In places, a random patch of moisture produced alien in the dryness, a fine stand of slash pine or long leaf yellow that constituted pine islands which were visible from a great distance to anyone standing on a rise. As intriguing as the landscape appeared, its principal contribution to the earnings of the subsistence farmers laboriously tending its soil was the harvest of wild game. Meat and skins that could be traded at crossroads stores for tools, ammunition, canned goods, and cloth, or sold for small sums to the steamboats that plied the larger rivers. Penny Baxter's persistent poverty resulted not only from his choice of land, but from the size of his family. A number of successful pregnancies had failed to produce the large family that was, success, that was essential to farming success. Family wealth was as closely tied to reproduction as production. Children were put to work early, but a son's value increased at around age 12 when his physical strength enabled him to begin plowing and learning other skills that required upper body development. There's a set of 
of uh, documents in the Tennessee Historical, um, the Tennessee State Archive, of a survey that was done in the early 20th century of Civil War veterans. And uh, they persistently, regardless of age uh, or their station in life, they all talked about uh, that young men, black and white, went to work plowing at about age 12. That was when they had enough upper body strength to be able to do that. With teenage sons, a man could put more acres under cultivation, and with the help of the women of the family, harvest a larger crop. With each additional male laborer, the family's poten potential for enhancing their wealth increased. With only a single son who offered little assistance in the family's production, the Baxters fared poorly in comparison to their neighbors, the Foresters. As Buck Forrester observed, observed, you Baxters is making out, and that's about all, ain't it? In making out, Penny relied on a strategy that built on his intimate knowledge of the environment. His observations of the plants and the habits of local wildlife enable the family to survive when weather and foraging animals undermine their farming efforts. Penny was careful with his harvest of forest animals, unlike his neighbors, who seemed to kill for the pleasure of shooting them. He was also careful in his protection of the domestic animals on his farm, pinning his hogs and cows, a somewhat unusual practice for southern subsistence, farmer, subsistence farmers who generally allowed their animals to range free. It was even stranger for a farmer with so few labor resources, the amount of labor that it would take to, uh, to make the pens uh, was labor Penny could ill afford, but then he could also ill afford to lose his animals. Floridians allowed their animals to range free until the legislature finally enacted stock laws in the mid 20th century, long after other states had required farmers to control their animals. When times were good, Penny Baxter made out okay. But subsistence agriculture was a precarious life. Storms, floods, droughts, fire, snake bites, pests, illness, accident were among the many calamities that could change a good year into a struggle for survival. And when any of those calam calamities occurred, neighbors and kin stepped in to mitigate the damage. Penny understood this better than anyone. He had no resources for overcoming disaster. He was pleased that his farm was some distance from that of his neighbors, the foresters. He abhorred their drinking and fighting, but he dared not confront them directly, not only because of his small size, but because he would need the support they could offer in hard times. So the men hunted together to rid their land of dangerous predators and shared the meat from their hunts. And when the newly planted crop was destroyed and Penny was laid up by a rattlesnake bite, Buck Forrester took up the slack and replanted the corn. As he told Jody when he came to ask for help, no use to fret, boy. We don't hold nothing again, folks, in trouble. Nostalgia encourages, encourages us to believe that what we call neighborless, neighborliness is evidence of a better time. The yearling enables us to see it as a survival strategy. The Baxter family was truly isolated from the advantages of town. Unschooled and unchurched, they nevertheless attempted to provide Jody with some education and a religious foundation. Unable to attract a teacher to the area, Penny taught Jody to read and made an effort to be consistent in his reading and arithmetic. He wanted his son to have the advantages of a modest education, a desire that confronts the stereotype of subsistence farmers. However, I think Rollins got it right. Many farmers had rudimentary education. They could read and cipher in the parlance of the day. And they were often surprisingly knowledgeable about the world around them. Current Americans may disagree with their views of that time, 
but they often demonstrated considerable knowledge of the local and national events that were shaping their lives. They were not well educated, but they were also not ignorant. Women suffered the most from the isolation that characterized the farms in the scrub. Men traveled to town to purchase whatever items could not be purchased, produced it on the farm. Surviving diaries and notes record the meticulous instructions women gave their men on the purchase of cloth and cooking utensils. If the money did not stretch far enough, it would be the women's requests that were ignored. And just as often, mail store owners fail to carry the items women desired. Patrick Smith takes up that theme in a land remembered as Tobias repeatedly promises a Dutch oven for Emma, a promise never fulfilled. If a woman had several children, the likelihood of traveling into town herself were even smaller. Preparing for a day from home meant preparing food for everyone and quilts for naps, a long bumpy ride, shepherding the children along the few commercial streets whose sites were quickly exhausted and then waiting for the men to finish their trading and fighting and drinking for the long ride home. People actually began to recognize this as a, as a difficulty uh, and in the 1910s and 1920s, um, uh, produced what they called the ladies' restroom. It was not a bathroom facility, although there were generally bathroom facilities available, but it was a place where women, poor women coming into town, uh, could come and sit. Um, there were usually cots for babies and sofas for the women to sit on, and um, they had the a table for eating, um, so they didn't have to just uh, make do on the streets of the town uh, when they came in with their men to shop. Uh, traveling uh, merchants also began to recognize there was a market out there. So a lot of women bought the needles, the thread, and other things from traveling merchants who came around. Even festivals and frolics were increasing sources of embarrassment for women wearing um, out-of-fashion clothes. In the 1890s, farm newspapers began to include drawings of the latest fashions and instructions on how to adapt those fashions um, to the cloth that was available to the women and to the kinds of life, lives that they led. Rawlings presents Ma Baxter as a hard woman, constantly concerned about the rations at home uh, and working from dawn to night in her steady round of cooking, preserving, patching, and cleaning. Her only relaxation seems to be the few minutes she sits in the rocker, and even then she's sewing. Depriva deprivation accounts for some of her hardness, but we can also admire the stoicism that she developed as one pregnancy after another produced a child who quickly died. Might her pregnancies have been more successful if she had had the companionship of other women? Was her lack of joy a result of her lack? of her isolation. Frontier stories, whether historically based or literary, depict farm women consistently in stark tones. Although men saw the frontier as a challenge and an opportunity, women were much less enthusiastic as they agonized over the loss of companionship with other women that such a life produced. Penny, like other farmers of his time, recognized the harshness of their situation, and he expressed good intentions to ease his wife's burdens. He repeatedly reminded Jody of the promise he had made to dig a well close to the home, house. But years passed without the first shovel of dirt, and we know Ma Baxter will never enjoy water from her own well. I know a man uh, who's deceased now, but he lived in Appalachia, and he tells the story about the moment when, um, through TVA, water came to his mother's house. And she stood at the sink, and the, she turned the water on. And she threw her apron over her head, and she just cried. She cried. It was such a miracle to have water that she didn't have to carry uh, from a well or a cistern uh, in her own house. 
Men exercised a freedom from the hard labor of farming that eluded women. They hunted and fished, and even when the experience was mandated by necessity, there was a sense of enjoyment in the shared experience, the camaraderie of tramping through the woods, spinning tales, sitting around the campfire, and sleeping under the stars. Jody relished the opportunity to explore nat nature with his father, absorb his wisdom, and listen to his stories of the past. Women had few such opportunities, and when they did socialize, they felt the burden, as we've already said, of their isolated frontier farms. Hattie Austin recalled a day on the porch of her neighbor and her desire for the companionship of her family and friends in Indiana. After she'd told her, her story of loneliness, the older woman admonished her for her tears. Why, you are a pioneer woman, Hattie recalled, and you must be brave and not give way to your feelings. Ma Baxter could not have said it better. The enduring quality of the yearling resides in Marjorie Kennan Rawlings' skill in capturing the tension between the environmental majesty and the precariousness of the Baxter's existence. The book conveys the unending labor of subsistence agriculture in 1870s Florida and the impact of the struggle to eke out a living from the soil on the sensibilities of the people who experienced that life. It left men and women hardened. There was no place for a yearling in their world. Thank you.